Superhouse Racing will likely leave Ford at the end of 2024, and there's a lot of talk that Honda could still be joining NASCAR. What's going, guys? It's Daniel, and welcome back to our video. We got to NASCAR and other motorsports stories discussed today on the channel. Let's go ahead and just jump straight into those really quickly. We're first going to take a look at a couple paint schemes that have been revealed over the course of the last couple of days. Let's go ahead and just jump straight into it. The first paint scheme we're taking a look at is Alex Bowman's 2024 Ally Best Friends scheme. This scheme is pretty solid, in my opinion. Not as good as the one from 2021 or 2022, but I still think it's very solid. Hopefully, Alex Bowman can have a good run this week at M. Phoenix in in this scheme. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Denny Hamlin's 2024 Brakes Plus scheme that we'll see this weekend at Phoenix. It's a little bare, but honestly, I like the red color on it. It looks pretty solid. It's not absolutely perfect, though, and hopefully Denny Hamlin can have a solid run with this scheme. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Bubba Wallace's 2024 Air Force scheme that we'll see this weekend at Phoenix. I think this looks solid in my opinion. It's kind of hard to tell how this will look once the render, once we actually get on the racetrack. It kind of looks like a render, so I'm not exactly saying this scheme is good or not until we see it out on the racetrack, but I'm glad to see the Air Force is back sponsoring Bubba Wallace. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Jeb Burns' 2024 Normal Precision Scheme that we'll see in two races in 2024. This scheme's okay in my opinion, nothing special about it. Glad to see that Normal Precision will be sponsoring him for a few races. And the final paint scheme we're taking a look at is Tyler Reddick's 2024 Pegasus Mobile One scheme that we'll see this weekend at Phoenix. This looks really good in my opinion. It's not the best Mobile One scheme that's been revealed so far this year, but I think it looks absolutely amazing and looks incredible, and hopefully Tyler Reddick can have a great run with this scheme this weekend. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the Marsville Truck Series race as they have a title sponsor for this event. It's going to be called the Long John Silvers 200. If I'm not mistaken, I believe Long John Silvers did sponsor the spring race at Marsville for the Truck Series last year. So it's good to see Long John Silvers is back. Obviously, a lot of people think that company's been gone, but obviously Bob Jenkins has some investment in the company. He's a franchise owner, which is why they're still involved in the sport. Nonetheless, glad to see Long John Silvers is back to sponsor the Marsville Truck Race. And now we're going to head to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Roto-Rooter. As it was announced yesterday, the Roto-Rooter will sponsor Sam Mayer for two races in 2024. They'll sponsor him at Coda in a couple weeks, and they'll sponsor him at Iowa Speedway. I'm not exactly sure what Roto-Rooter does, but this will be the first time I think that Roto-Rooter has sponsored him. So it's really cool to see if they're joining Junior Motorsports for the first time. And it's pretty good to see if they'll be sponsoring him for two races in the 2024 NASCAR Xfinity Series season. And now we're going ahead to on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about CallA11.com. As it was announced yesterday that CallA11.com is going to sponsor Josh Williams for a select number of races throughout the 2024 season, including this weekend during the Xfinity Series race, which is kind of cool considering the fact that CallA11.com is going to be the main sponsor for the Xfinity Series race as well. I would have to imagine they're going to sponsor him at Marzal because that race will also have a CallA11.com entitlement, and there's going to be a couple other races I believe that CallA11.com is going to be sponsoring as well. This car looks solid in my opinion. Hopefully we'll see a good run for him this weekend with that sponsorship. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Surf Pro. As it was announced yesterday that Surf Pro will sponsor Noah Gregson at Phoenix. For those who are kind of familiar with this company, they have sponsored Kyle Busch and his son Brexton in the past. And they've been sponsoring Brexton Bush on his way up. I believe it's the first time that Surf Pro will be sponsoring an NASCAR Cup Series driver though. But what's kind of interesting is this car kind of looks like the old GoDaddy schemes, which Jeff's schemes kind of had a history of wrecking a lot, even though Noah Grayson's coming off having a really good run at Vegas. We'll see what happens with the scheme. It looks kind of solid, in my opinion. It gives me those old GoDaddy vibes. And I don't know if this will be the only time we'll see Surf Pro. We'll have to see if this is the only time we're going to see that paint scheme on the racetrack in 2024. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about gold bowling. As it was announced yesterday afternoon that gold bowling is back with Eric Amarola. They are going to sponsor Eric Amarola for two races in the Xfinity Series in 2024. They're going to sponsor him this weekend at Phoenix, and then they'll sponsor him at Watkins Glen later in the year. 
Gold Bullings had a partnership with Eric Armbrol, I think, since 2017 or 2018. So it's good to see they're jumping over with Eric Armbrol, which means it confirms that they've left Stuart Haas Racing, and they'll be once again working with Eric Armbrol this season for a couple races. It's good to see they've got the entitlement and sponsorship, and glad to see the Gold Bulling will once again be working with him in 2024. Pretty exciting move overall to see that they're going to be working once again in 2024. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about MotoGP. As it was reported by Adam Stern, I believe it was on Monday, that MotoGP is in talks to move coverage to Warner Brothers de Development. And they look to grow in the United States. Obviously, MotoGP has been on NBC for many years. I can't remember exactly what year they started working on NBC. But they're wanting to move over to TNT, and they're wanting to move over to streaming. As the Warner Brothers group continues to grow their sports portfolio, and obviously NASCAR is working with them as well. And the other reason they're trying to go in the U.S. is because you got Trackhouse Racing that is involved with MotoGP. Though I don't know how competitive they're going to end up being this year, they are involved with MotoGP in a pretty big way. They also got some big people coming over there. Davidi Bravo's working with the team as well to try to help grow and develop their group. It is pretty cool, though, to see that they're going to be working with them in 2024, that being Trackhouse. And I think it's cool to see that they're in talks to move over there. We'll see how things end up working out and playing out, and we'll see how they end up performing in 2024 over there. And it's cool to see that MotoGP will likely be headed over to the Warner Brothers group in 2024. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Ryan Vargas. As it was announced yesterday that Ryan Vargas will be driving to 32 for Jordan Anderson Racing this weekend at Phoenix. It needs to be known this is not going to be the only announcement that Ryan Vargas is going to have this week. This, I believe, will be Ryan Vargas' first Xfinity Series start in quite a bit of time. And the reason he's getting behind the wheel in the number 32 car is even though this technically is a Jordan Anderson racing car, they are using a My Carmen racing engine. And Ryan Vargas has driven for My Carmen racing in the past. I don't expect this car to set the world on fire. This car is in a decent position owner's point, so Ryan should be in a good position to make the field. But he should be at least a little bit concerned considering the lack of speed we've seen from this car in the past. So we'll see what Ryan Vargas can do. I think he's going to have a little bit of a difficult time making the show. There's a lot of really fast cars. We'll see if they have the pace and speed to be able to make the show. But I am very happy to see, nonetheless, that Ryan Vargas is getting the chance and opportunity to be back in the Xfinity Series in 2024. Hopefully he can do really, really good with the team this season. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the Rolex 24 TV ratings. Now, we've talked about the main TV ratings from the Rolex 24, but according to Adam Stern, it was reported yesterday that while AMSA's Rolex 24 ratings were down 14% on TV, digital streaming on Peacock more than doubled from 2023. That might be where the 14% actually went because a lot more people went over to Peacock to watch the whole entire event. Is, I think it costs only like $10 to get a Peacock subscription. And while commercials are still, still a thing, and I was on the, the Peacock broadcast, there were definitely a lot of commercials. During the Peacock side of things, you could watch the whole broadcast for free. If you've got a good, and not for free, if you have a good internet connection, you can watch a whole event on Peacock, which saves you a lot of money. And a lot of people, of course, are backing off of cable subscriptions, and they're going more toward the streaming side of things. That's why you're seeing these numbers come out of TV numbers in most areas dropping in significant ways. It's good to see if Peacock numbers are up considering Peacock needs to have their subscriptions up because they've had issues when it comes to the number of subscriptions they've had in the past. We'll see what happens in the future, see if Peacock continues to grow. But it's at least good to see that while the ratings were down on TV, it is good to see the ratings at least were up for the main event overall on Peacock. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Callum Eilat. As it was announced yesterday, that Callum Eilat will be driving a six for Aero McLaren in the first IndyCar race at St. Petersburg. Callum Eilat last year competed full-time with Hunkos Hollinger Racing, but now is focused on the World Endurance Championship. The reason that Callum Eilat will be behind the wheel of the six car this weekend in St. Pete, because remember IndyCar kicks off their season this weekend, is because of the fact that David Malukas, who's supposed to be driving his car full-time, time he currently is sitting out due to surgery and will be only as of right now i think missing the first race though he could miss the second race of the season 
This is going to be the best opportunity that Callum Isla has ever had in his IndyCar career. And I think he's going to make the most of it. We have seen Errol McLaren be really fast in this event in the past. They've got some really good talent over there. Of course, you've got some really great drivers. And I think that Callum Isla is going to be very competitive in this event. I don't think he's going to win, but I think he's got a really great chance and an opportunity to get a top 10 and put the six car in a good position when it comes to the winner's circle. Really great opportunity for Callum and nonetheless glad to see that he'll get the chance and opportunity to compete in the St. Pete Grand Prix. Yes, he's competing full-time in the World Endurance Championship, but I think he'll absolutely will be able to make the best out of it in this event in 2024. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Rudy Fugel. Now, Rudy Fugel was on Sirius M NASCAR Radio on Monday, and he revealed that the trash bag that went on the front of the 24 car during the race that brought him down pit road, apparently they said there was a beer can inside that trash bag and apparently got inside the cooling box or something like that, which is one of the reasons why the car overheated. That is a really bad luck and really bad luck, for unfortunately, for the 24 team and organization. Because William Bob, well, I don't think he would have had a car capable of beating Kyle Larson or Tyler Reddick. I certainly think he would have finished top three or top four in the event. And they were able to come back at least and finish inside the top five, all things considered. But unfortunately, they had those issues. They had to come down pit road, and they had to fix the car. I hope that the bad luck goes away for this team because they had a really strong year last year. They obviously won the Daytona 500, and they're in a good position in the points right now where if we get 16 winners, they shouldn't be in major trouble. And like I said, they still were able to come back and finish inside the top 10. Hopefully there's no more issues for the team and organization. It's unfortunate that they had the beer can they got in front of that car, but hopefully there'll be no more issues coming for that team in the not-so-distance future, and they can focus on trying to win a championship this year. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Dale Coyne Racing. As Dale Coyne Racing finally, after a lot of speculation, has announced their 2024 IndyCar lineup. Jack Harvey is going to drive the number 18 car for 14 races in 2024, while Nolan Siegel is going to drive the 18 for the other four races this season. Nolan Siegel is going to be driving, I think, at the Thermal Club, I think the Indy 500, and a couple other races later this season. And Colin Braun, you probably know that name from the NASCAR side and the IMSA side, will drive the 51 car as and now for St. Pete and Thermal, but could make more starts depending on sponsorship and funding. And it's also reported that Catholic Lake might also drive that 51 car in the Indy 500, though it's not been officially announced at this point. This is a really good opportunity for all those drivers. Jack Harvey competed full time most of the year last year for Ray Hall, Letterman, Lanigan before unfortunately being let go to the lack of performance. Nolan Siegel, very, very talented driver in the Indy Lights series. I don't think he'll be eligible for the Rookie of the Year honors. He's going to be contending for that, but I don't think he's going to have a chance to win the Rookie of the Year honors this season. And then, of course, you have Colin Brown, like I said. Colin Braun, this is an amazing opportunity for that driver. I think he's one of the best drivers out there in the U.S. He's gotten better as a driver over the years, and he's been really quick in IMSA as well. And he almost won his class. In fact, he actually, I think, almost did win in his class, though he got beat by Connor Solich in the event. This is an amazing opportunity for all four drivers, and I'm glad to see that all drivers have signed. We finally know Dale Coyne Racing's lineup, and we'll see what other drivers announce because there are some races that are currently available for Dale Coyne Racing in 2024. We'll see what other races they decide to go ahead and run in the 2024 season. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the Bahrain Grand Prix TV ratings. According to Adam Stern, ESPN got 1.122 million viewers for Saturday's Bahrain Grand Prix. That is down 14% from 2023, where the event got 1.31 million viewers. Now, it does need to be noted that this race this year was run on a Saturday compared to when the race is usually run on a Sunday. So that's probably one of the reasons why the ratings were down a little bit. But I think the ratings, regardless if they've been run on Sunday or if they ran on Saturday, I think regardless, the ratings would have been down. And here is why. You have a lot of drama going off of the racetrack currently at the moment. You've got the Christian Horner saga. You've got the rumors of Mohammed Ben Suleyam playing roles in maybe some of these races. And you've got some other allegations that have been going on behind the scenes. But the other reason why people are tuning out of F1 a little bit, especially in the U.S., is because of domination. 
Parity plays a massive role when it comes to racing product. And if you don't have parity, you've got one guy winning almost every single race, especially by 22 seconds or large margins, people are going to tune out of your event very, very quickly. As much as Max Verstappen, you know, I, I like Max Verstappen. I like him winning these races, and I think Max Verstappen is great. When you have a driver that's as good as he is in a very lethal and dominant car, less people are going to tune in. So as unfortunate as it is, it's not a major shock and not a surprise to see that the ratings were down for this event. And honestly, I do expect that the next race is going to be down in TV ratings, especially from the NASCAR crowd, and also not letting Andretti in. Definitely played a major role and major part in the ratings being down overall. And now we're going to go ahead jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Circuit of the Americas. As it was announced on Monday that for the Cup Series, Groups A and B will be getting 20 extra minutes of practice to fill out the short track and road course package. Remember, for this weekend at Phoenix, it was already announced that they'll be getting a 50-minute session on Friday. But uh, for Dakota, because this is the first road course race, because they also will be the first race for the new road course package that's going to be coming into play, they're giving them extra time. I think this actually is a really good decision, which means that practice is now going to be 90 minutes instead of the original 40 minutes, and then they'll lead, I think, right into qualifying. I think this is the right decision to let them feel it out. And personally, if you want my honest opinion, I think this needs to be normal. I don't think this should just be like extraordinary circumstances, like a new package. I think every single race, there should be 50-minute sessions of practice to give these drivers a little bit of experience. I also think we should stop doing the rounds of qualifying and go to just a single round of qualifying like the Xfinity Series does. If you want to do two rounds for super speedways and do the extra rounds for road courses, I'm definitely okay with that and fine with that. But to me, I just don't understand why we can't make things a little more simple and just do groups A and B, put them all together for a 50-minute session. It would save a little bit of time of practice, not going to 90 minutes. And I also think it would make a lot more sense to have everyone get a little experience on their track because if you have someone spin out, that's an extra 5, 10 minutes and everyone has to come back down pit row, which I don't think really makes any sense to be honest. I really hope this is not extraordinary circumstance and I hope that every single race going into the future, we get a little more practice. I'm hoping with the next TV deal and TV contract, we can get a little more practice for these guys out on the racetrack because in my personal opinion, there needs to be more practice for the drivers on the racetrack. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Jack Hawksworth. As it was announced Monday morning that Jack Hawksworth will be driving the one truck for Tricon Garage at Circuit of the Americas, making his Craftsman Truck Series debut. For those who do not know who Jack Hawksworth is, Jack Hawksworth has made starts in NASCAR in the past. He drove the 20 car, I believe it was, or the 18 car for Joe Gibbs Racing back in 2018 or 2019 in Mid-Ohio. I think he won a stage and was pretty competitive in the event. He also has won championships in IMSA GT class with Lexus. Lexus and Toyota also have a pretty massive and a pretty big partnership. I don't have him winning this race at this point, even though he does have quite a bit of experience at Circuit Americas, but he might be someone to pick as an underdog. He's a very good road course racer, and I think of how fast Tricon Garage has been on all these types of tracks, including road courses. We saw Williams Walsh be extremely competitive at Mid-Ohio in this truck. I would have to imagine that Jack Hawksworth is going to be a major threat and a serious contender to get it done at Coda. I think he's got a good enough truck capable of getting it done. I'm just so excited to see all of these road course stringers, and I expect this time progressing goes on, we're going to see a lot more road course stringers and road course drivers come out and run these events. I'm really excited about this, and like I said, it's just cool and awesome to see that we are going to see Jack Hawksworth in the Truck Series race at Circuit of the Americas. I hope we can see more random drivers come out and show up, and I hope that we get more ringers showing up in the Truck Series race because there's some rumors we're going to see a third RCR car, and I think the Sage 60 car could also run. Nonetheless, I'm really happy to see that Jack Hawksworth will be driving the one truck for Tricon Garage at Circuit of the Americas. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Corey LaJoy versus Carson Hosovar. Now, this is a story that I've not been able to talk about at this point, but after the NASCAR Cup Series race at Las Vegas Motor Speedway, Corey LaJoy, while he was happy about the performance of Spire Motorsports in general, he was not very happy with Carson Hosovar. He basically says that he basically got walled into the outside wall by his teammate. And then Jonathan Fell, a reporter both for, I think, the pit racing experts, actually asked Corey LaJoy what he will t- what the conversation is going to be between both of the drivers. And Corey LaJoy says, we'll see. 
Now, Spire Motorsports, like I mentioned, was extremely competitive and very, very fast. However, we know that basically there was a little tension, and Carson knows far some over the years has not made a lot of drivers very, very happy. But sometimes Corey LaJoy, and basically there's no footage and evidence of this happening, which is why a lot of people kind of don't believe Corey LaJoy at this point, and some don't believe him, because Corey LaJoy, while I do like him, he's also someone who historically has not been the best when it comes to taking responsibility. He's someone who's been aggressive at times as well, and has also caused wrecks in the past as well, which is why, like I said, a lot of people do not believe Corey LaJoy in this situation. They're going to blame him regardless. I wonder if we'll hear this on Stacking Pennies. I think Stacking Pennies is supposed to come out later today, or it's already come out at this point. But the fact that this is a talking point in conversation is definitely frustrating for a team that is coming into a race where they were all really fast, outside of Zane Smith, who unfortunately wrecked out a little bit early because he basically had a broken toe link and finished 13 laps down in the event. It is going to be very interesting to see if these two continue to have tension and beef on the racetrack and if things are going to spill out of control from this. All I'm going to say is I really hope it doesn't spill out of control because I like both these drivers and both the drivers had a lot of speed. Corey LaJoy was in the top five at one point in this race and Carson Osbar came back from a flat tire and was able to make a pretty solid and great comeback. So I really hope this doesn't spill out of control and they can move on from this and focus on continuing to grow Spire Motorsports as an organization. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Frankie Muniz. As it was officially announced on Monday evening that Frankie Muniz will be driving a 35 for Joey Gase Motorsports this weekend at Phoenix. This will be the second start that Frankie Muniz will make in the NASCAR Xfinity Series as of course he did make his Xfinity Series debut at Daytona a few weeks ago for unfortunately finishing in 33rd or 34th place due to having a broken tire rod on the car at Daytona. He'll be looking to have a bounce back performance with the team and organization. It's also rumored at this point that Frankie has bought into this organization, though there's been nothing official at this point on that. I'm excited to see Frankie Miz back in the NASCAR Xfinity Series. We don't know the rest schedule that Frankie is going to run this year. Again, this also technically kind of corresponds with his ARCA schedule, considering the fact that we started Daytona ARCA last year, and then he ran at Phoenix. So I imagine he's going to be running all the race that he ran at ARCA, in the Xfinity Series with the team. Now, this team is technically on the bubble currently in the owner's points right now, so they are going to have to kind of watch how they do in qualifying, and so far, the 35 car has kind of struggled this year in owner's points and struggled to make it into these races, and they haven't had the overall pace and speed. But if there's anyone that can try to help that car get in a little bit of a better position on the racetrack, it's definitely someone like a Frankie Minas. We'll see how they end up doing, and we'll see how they end up performing this week, and we'll see if they can make it. But like I said, I'm just happy to see if Frankie Minas is back in the NASCAR Xfinity Series this weekend. Hope we can make the best of it and have a really strong run with Joey Gase Motorsports this weekend at Phoenix. Hope we're able to make the best of it and have a really strong run this weekend at Phoenix International Raceway. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about safety culture. As it was announced that Shane Van Gisbergen officially has a new sponsorship with safety culture. They're going to sponsor Shane Van Gisbergen for three NASCAR Xfinity Series races in 2024. This weekend at Phoenix, and later this year in Michigan, and then they'll sponsor him at Kansas in the fall. It was also officially confirmed that Shane Van Gisbergen is going to drive the 16 for Colleg Racing in the NASCAR Cup Series at Daytona International Speedway, adding on another race. This race was not originally scheduled for Shane Van Gisbergen, so now instead of having seven NASCAR Cup Series races, which its first race will be at Circuit Americas in a couple weeks into 16, it'll be now eight races that'll run, including three or two Super Speedway races on his schedule. Shane Van Gisbergen picking up safety culture. I think they've worked with him in the past in the nat in in the world of supercars, but it's really cool that he's bringing another sponsorship over. We know that he's got other sponsorships with Wendy's later this year down the road, and other companies are going to be working with him as well throughout 2024. But to see that another company like Safety Culture is coming on to work with Shane Van Gisbergen is really awesome and really incredible because a lot of people in the industry really like Shane Van Gisbergen. He's proven himself. He's done really good in supercars, and while he did unfortunately have issues with Las Vegas Motor Speed. Way, he did have a car that was probably going to be capable of finishing inside the top 20. We're going to really get to see in how fast he is. Historically, college racing has not been that great 
at a track like Phoenix. They've kind of struggled in the past, and I'm not expecting much from the organization, at least in the Xfinity Series, maybe outside of AJ Allmendinger, or if SVG can do good, because historically, road course drivers tend to do pretty good at Phoenix, so maybe, just maybe, SVG could come in there and finish inside the top 10 and have a really, really awesome and great performance. We'll see what SVG can do, but I think it's really phenomenal and great to see that safety culture is going to be joining and working with Shane Van Gisbergen this year in a select number of races in the 2024 season. And now we're going to go ahead to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the Las Vegas TV ratings. It was reported by Adam Stern yesterday that Fox got 4.359 million viewers for Sunday's race at Las Vegas. That is up 9% from last year, which had 3.991 million viewers. This is absolutely huge. To see that the ratings continue to go up in a massive and huge way for the Cup Series for the second race in a row is really good. Because remember, for Atlanta, the ratings were up 7% from the previous year. Now we're up 9% or nearly double digits. And there's a few reasons why I believe that the ratings are going up. One, the racing product right now is absolutely incredible. I think all three races, the Daytona 500, the race at Atlanta, and the race at Las Vegas, all three races were absolutely bangers. Not all of them were barn burners, but I thought Vegas was a really, really good race. Atlanta was one of the best NASCAR races of all time, and the Daytona 500 was one of the best Daytona 500s in recent years. When you have a good racing product, you're going to have a lot more people tuning in. The second right reason why the ratings were up for Vegas is because of the Atlanta photo finish. That Atlanta finish got a ton of people talking and a lot of people tuned in. You think about that peak number as well. I think it peaked at 5.2 million viewers, which is really, really huge, by the way, for a third race of the year. The third reason is because Chase Elliott was in this race this time around. That's another reason why the ratings were up. But again, when you have a good racing product, when you have a lot of parity, and you got a lot of good racing on the racetrack, you're going to have a lot of people that are going to talk about the racing product, and they are going to tune in, especially if the racing is really strong and really, really good. I absolutely enjoyed the racing. It was really, really fun to watch, and just to see that the ratings continue to go up as start of this year is really great. Phoenix, though, hasn't been the greatest racing product, so maybe people will tune out. Hopefully, though, we continue to see this trend of ratings going up, especially with this being the final year of the current contract before we switch over to Amazon and the Warner Brothers and TNT, which are probably going to see less viewership numbers in certain areas there, though, of course, they're trying to push in a big way for people to get on those networks. I still think this is absolutely huge for the sport, and glad to see that the Las Vegas TV ratings are up. Once again, for the third, second week in a row, and had the 500 happen on time, I think the ratings would have been up there as well. And now we're going ahead, Jabon, to the next story of today's episode, as we're talking about Dale Jr. Now, there was a little bit of a Reddit post that went a little viral on Monday, talking about why Dale Jr. was let go by NBC. Remember, it's been confirmed that Dale Jr., or not officially announced yet, but it's been kind of confirmed at this point, that Dale Jr. is going to be leaving NBC and won't be there even in 2024, and is going to be joining Amazon and the Warner Brothers in 2025. So he'll be working for 10 races and set around 16. There was a Reddit post that kind of went viral, like I mentioned, talking about the reason that Dale Jr. was let go. One, apparently they said they were talking about like them having a remote booth, and they're also because Dale Jr. was getting yelled at quite a bit by producers, and they were clashing quite a bit. Well, it got so viral that even Dale Jr. actually even had to respond to this situation, and he basically came in and dispelled the rumors. He says that there's no truth to the rumors, said they were not planning to have a remote booth, and he said that there was no tension and beef behind the scenes between him and NBC, and he loved everything about NBC, and dispelled the rumors. And they said they never were yelled at. Now, I'm going to say one thing. Did Dale Jr. get let go because he got yelled at? No, absolutely not. The reason Dale Jr. left NBC is because of pay. The Amazon, we have historically known, they're a company that tends to pay a lot of money to try to pick up the best of the best. They played Al Michaels and people that have gone over to Amazon a lot of money, even if they're not as good as they used to be, because Amazon's a billions of billions of dollars. They're going to do whatever they can to try to pick up the best of the best, especially with a broadcast surrounding them. NBC probably wasn't going to pay Dale Jr. as much, which is why he left NBC to work over there. And I'm not going to say that Dale Jr. is completely telling the truth either in certain instances. I'm glad he cleared this up, 
But I don't think he's 100% telling the truth about getting yelled at. They probably didn't yell at him, per se, but they probably told him, like, we want you to look at the computer. But again, I look at, because Dale Jr. even said this about a week or two ago on his podcast, that they basically would like people to look at the computer, and Dale Jr. said, no, I want to focus what's going on on the racetrack, which is absolutely why I agree with Dale Jr. 100%, by the way, that you should be focusing on what's going on in the racetrack and not focusing on what's going on in a TV. And as for the remote booth situation, Eric Esep, I think, did a really good job explaining this as well. Remote booths are no good in NASCAR, especially. You need to have these direct people at the racetrack. We saw this with some of the Truck Series broadcasts last year. They had them at the, especially for the championship race, which, by the way, was one of the worst championship races we've ever seen. They had them at the, at the Charlotte compound and not at the racetrack, which is unacceptable, especially for a championship event and a championship race. You want these people at the racetrack to call your events. So to me, while I think Dale Jr. is absolutely telling the truth in certain instances, I think that they probably did get a little frustrated with him calling out on the track. But to be honest with you guys, I would rather see want to see what's going on in the racetrack. And I think Dale Jr. did a great job with NBC. And I think he is, in general, going to do a fantastic and a really good job with Amazon and the Warner Brothers going into the future. I'm excited to see what happens for Dale Jr. And we'll be excited to see what Amazon and the Warner Brothers have in store for him as Silly Season picks up for the, for the media stuff as well as we get closer to the start of 2025. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Mexico. Now, we've talked about this on the channel quite a few times, but there's been a lot of talk and chatter when it comes to the 2025 schedule already, despite only being going into race four of the 2024 Cup Series season. Why has there been a lot of chatter? Well, during Daytona, and they're in Daytona 500, we had a lot of talk from Steve Phelps, who got interviewed by Chris Byers from Fox, and they talked about the fact that they are talking about going to Canada, going to Mexico, and staying in the Southern California market for 2025. Now, according to Jordan Bianchi from The Athletic, he says that Mexico has emerged as the frontrunner for 2025 for the NASCAR Cup Series. He did mention that while Canada is still a major possibility to pick up some racing in 2025, Mexico is the current frontrunner. It's no secret that it sounds like the Bushlight Clash would probably be the date, unless it is a points paying race we're talking about. It sounds like, though, more than likely, according to reports, it sounds like that when it comes to Mexico, they might be moving the clash away from the L.A. Coliseum, because, of course, this is the last year of the L.A. Coliseum contract. They, even though NASCAR, like I said, does want to stay in the Southern California market, I believe they're talking about moving away from that Southern California market and moving it to Mexico. Mexico is a growing market. They've been talking about maybe going to the Auto Drama Hernando Rodriguez track, and they also have been talking about going as well to maybe Guadalajara. That's where we're talking about moving the clash. And as much people are probably against that, Guadalajara is actually closer in distance to Charlotte and the Daytona 500. And we have a large Latin American audience that is continuing to grow in the U.S. And you have a driver like Daniel Suarez, who's coming off of winning at Atlanta, who's probably going to get a contract extension with Trackhouse Racing, though nothing's been announced at this point on that, though it's more than likely that it's going to happen. So Mexico, I think, is a very big possibility. But let's go back to that Canada rumor. Let's say we do go to Canada, in fact, in 2025. What tracks are available? Well, I think there's only two tracks that are really possible. You have... Of course, Circuit Joe's Villeneuve. Circuit Joe's Villeneuve almost hosted a NASCAR Cup Series race this year, but because of the fact that the F1 race got moved to the date that NASCAR was hoping to have the race on, they didn't want to clash at Formula 1, which is why they didn't have a race at Circuit Joe's Villeneuve, unfortunately. But I do believe that Circuit Joe's Villeneuve would be able to put on a really strong and a really great product for the NASCAR Cup Series. Because every time the Xfinity Series raced there, the racing was always phenomenal and absolutely incredible. So I think it'd be really fun for them to go there. The other track they go to is Canadian Tire Motorsports Park, also known as Mossport. This track always put on really good truck series races outside of the 2019 event and maybe the ending of 2015. I thought the racing was really good in the truck series there. And if the truck series wanted to race there and not the Cup Series, they could absolutely do that. 
But I would imagine Canada is still a very big possibility because I do believe we are going to Mexico next year. I think that with the 2025 schedule probably coming out a little earlier because we know there's been a lot of rumors that they're going to try to release the schedule a little bit earlier this year because last year released schedule in October. I think they're going to try to release schedule sometime in August or September this year, though I could be entirely wrong and they release schedule a little bit later. But I look at Mexico, for instance, and them trying to expand into Mexico and th- because they want to. They absolutely want to expand into different parts of the world. They want to start expanding internationally. You think about NASCAR trying to grow the sport. I believe that they are going to expand the sport naturally here in the not so distant future. So we'll see what happens when it comes to expansion and where they decide to go in the future. But it's going to be very fun to watch as we get closer to a potential announcement happening in the not so distant future. And now we're going to jump on to the first of two major stories in today's episode as we're talking about Honda. Now, over the last week or so, there's been a lot of talk and conversation surrounding Honda because there's a lot of talk currently at the moment that Honda could be joining NASCAR in the not so distant future. Last week, we reported on this channel that Marshall Press said on his podcast that Honda is in very, very serious talks. If you're a fan of Honda and if you're a fan of NASCAR, you're going to be really, really excited about the future. Obviously, like I mentioned a second ago, there's been a lot of talk and chatter surrounding the Honda may make a jump into the sport in the not so distant future. There's been some teams that have been linked to Honda recently that could make the jump. Now, NASCAR has not had a new manufacturer join the sport since 2004 when Toyota joined the NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series. Another big reason why Honda, because we've had Honda rumors and talks and conversations since probably all the way back in the year 2019. And they said they jumped when they got the chance. A few months ago, basically the owner or the guy who runs the HPT group in North America, Chuck Schulte, I think is the guy's name, said that NASCAR is one of the areas we may be looking at going to if IndyCar cannot get their hybrid system, the hybrid situation figured out. Now, let's talk about the possibilities here. When could Honda join? Now, a lot of people think there's a chance that Honda could join as early as 2025. But I'm being realistic with you guys. Unless Honda has been keeping this under wraps and under secrets, which let's be real and honest here, a lot of things in NASCAR does not get kept secret here, they're probably not going to be coming in 2025. There is a really good chance and possibility that they could join in 2026. But according to reports, they have to have their body panels approved by, I think, September 1st if they want to join in 2026. So they have plenty of time if they're going to join a sport. They have until September 1st of this year if they're going to join in 2026. But that's where the body come in. Let's talk about some teams that could go over to Honda if they are to join the sport. Let's first begin, of course, with Stuart Haas Racing. Stuart Haas Racing, we know, is only un- under contract for 2024. We're going to talk about them in just a little bit. But there have been some indications that Stuart Haas Racing may end up leaving Ford. Now, if they do end up joining, let's say, in 2026... I don't think SHR would go there immediately, but they could be a team to watch for to move over there. But they would also lose someone like Chase Briscoe, who, of course, is under contract with Ford currently at the moment. They might lose someone like him. They get some drivers like Haley Deegan over there, somebody like that to drive for their team and organization. That certainly could be a thing to watch for and a possibility. The next organization is Trackhouse Racing. Trackhouse Racing is a team that's always been very, very bold when it comes to moves, but they have a pretty big alliance with Chevy, and while they're never going to be the top team of Chevrolet, they still have been a really solid and great organization over the years. So I don't think Trackhouse Racing would be a massive team that could go over there, but they're certainly a team that's a possibility. Another team is Call of Racing. Call of Racing needs an absolute boost. They've been struggling in the NASCAR Cup Series for quite a bit of time, and they're a team that absolutely needs to make a major move if they're going to be back to the top once again like they were in 2021. If they could get their charter sold perhaps over to Trackhouse and Trackhouse buys out their Cup Series program, but Call of Racing is a team that definitely could be a team that moves over to Honda. You've also got Spire Motorsports. Spire Motorsports has a pretty massive and major alliance with Andretti. We know that the owner of the Group 1001, Dan Towns, has a major alliance with Spire. And Dan Towns is the owner of Andretti Global. And it's no secret that Michael Andretti, who's had to work with Honda for many, many years, he's interested in making a return or going over to NASCAR. Remember, Andretti Autosport or Andretti Global was actually going to come into NASCAR all the way back in the year 2013. They were going to come in 
with Kurt Busch driving the team, and also Matt Kenseth, if I believe I'm not mistaken, was going to be one of the drivers as well. So we know they're interested in making a jump in. And then the Earth team you think about as a potential possibility is maybe Chip Ganassi Racing making a return. It is no secret that Chip Ganassi Racing is interested, and they've inter- said this back on the Dale Jr. Download about a year ago when Chip Ganassi was on the Dale Jr. Download. They've been interested in wanting to make a return as well. And if Honda was to come in, that would be a really good move there. The other thing to think about, too, is if Honda does come in, there would be four more charters that could be potentially available, which would mean that we could expand the field back to, let's say, 43 or even 44 cars. NASCAR fans want 43 car fields once again, so there's more cars on the racetrack. If Honda does, in fact, end up joining the sport, they could definitely expand the field once again to a 40 car field. That is certainly a big possibility and a shout is something to watch out for. I know there's been like Sable saying it's just talks, and I know that's where it's kind of been at this point, but the fact that there's been a lot of talks and there's a lot of substance to this rumor tells me there's a really great chance and possibility that Honda is going to make the jump. I don't think they're going to come in 2025, but I think 2026 is more than likely the earliest that we'll see Honda join the sport. We'll see what happens in regards to these Honda rumors, and we'll see if they finally do get officially announced. But it sounds like the talks of Honda coming in are pretty substantial, and it might happen in the not-so-distant future. And now we're going to head jump on to the final major story of today's episode as we're talking about Stuart Haas Racing. Now, I talked about this on the channel a couple days ago, but over the weekend, it was reported by Jordan Bianchi from The Athletic that Stuart Haas Racing will likely be leaving Ford at the end of the 2024 season. There's been a lot of indications and rumblings that they are going to leave Ford. Now, why could Stuart Haas Racing be leaving Ford at the end of 2024 and going back to a different manufacturer? Well, this is the last year of the current contract that... Sewer Haas Racing has with Ford. And according to what we've been hearing, Mark Rushrook said this back at Daytona a few weeks ago when asked about, because remember it was announced a few weeks ago that Farmer Motorsports was going to be becoming a Tier 1 organization in the Ford group. Mark Rushbrook, who runs the Ford Performance Direction, he basically said no comment on if they are going to stay with Ford or not. And the indications are that SHR is likely going to be leaving at the end of this year. You look at Sewer Haas Racing. They have been on the decline over the last couple of years. And while they were pretty fast at Vegas, you had Chase Briscoe at top 5 and top 10 speed a lot of the day. And Noah Grayson, who was in the top 15 majority of the day, was able to get up inside the top 10. And they did have three cars, I think, finish around that top 20 area. They still have struggled over the last couple of years. They've lost sponsorship. They've lost multiple major drivers like Kevin Harvick and Eric Amarola. They lost the Bush Beer sponsorship that went over to Ross Chastain. They also lost a lot of other big sponsorships as well in recent years, in recent seasons, like Smithfield, and like I said, and they've lost Kurt Busch in years, and Clint Boyer in recent years. They've lost a lot of big names and brought a lot of younger drivers in. And while I don't think the drivers are a problem at SHR, you look at the organization itself, it has been on a massive decline in recent years and in recent seasons. When you think about SHR potentially moving over, it also make a lot of sense because it would kind of line up with the timeline of how long they were with Chevrolet. Remember, they were with Chevrolet from 2009 up until the end of 2016. It would be 2017-2024, which would be an eight-year cycle. Now, if SHR is to, in fact, leave Ford at the end of this year, where could they go? Well, there's only right now two manufacturers that are currently in NASCAR that are available, and then is Chevrolet and Toyota. Chevrolet would probably be the easiest choice to go with. They were with Chevrolet, like I said a minute ago, from 2009 to 2016, and they had their most of their success there. They, of course, won the championship with Kevin Harvick in 2014, and they won the championship with Tony Sturt in 2011. And I think while they weren't as competitive as they were at the beginning of their Ford tenure, they still were extremely competitive and were able to win races and able to win championships. They can't say that right now currently at the moment with the equipment they currently have right now. I think if they went back to Chevrolet, there's also talk of Junior Motorsports going to come into play. Obviously, I don't think Dale Jr. is going to buy into Sewer Haas Racing. That ain't going to happen, even though people think that Junior Motorsports could make a jump in at some point. That certainly could be an option, but right now I don't think that's possible because I think Junior wants to just bring his cup team up all together, and I don't think Junior just wants to invest in Sewer Haas Racing. I think he just wants to bring his team up to be very competitive right off the get-go. 
And then you think about Toyota. Toyota is the other manufacturer that is certainly a possibility. And there's been reports and rumors circulating that Toyota could be talking to Stuart Haas Racing. Again, I don't know if they're going to go to Toyota because even though while I think, there, like I said, there are rumors of them maybe that Toyota is talking to them, which again, I think every manufacturer is talking to SHR. Toyota right now has three big teams. They've got Legacy Motor Club with Eric Jones and John Hunter Nemechek and Jimmy Johnson and Corey Hyman, those guys. You've also got, of course, 2311 Racing with Bubba Wallace and Tyler Reddick and even Kurt Busch potentially coming back and maybe Carl Edwards coming back at some point. And then, of course, you have Joe Gibbs Racing with the four big drivers of Denny Hamlin and a couple other drivers like Ty Gibbs, Martin Truex Jr., and then, of course, Christopher Bell. And then you've got other drivers like Sheldon Creed, part of the Toyota Stable. So if they were go over there, there probably wouldn't be a Tier 1 organization, they probably would be a tier two. And they're also talking to Tony Stewart's drag racing team, a quarter reports that I have heard. Then you've got Honda, and I talked about Honda a second ago, but they're like I said, there's rumors of Honda potentially coming in and working there. But again, I think the earliest that SHR would go over there is 2026. I don't think they're going to switch to Honda right away in 2025, because again, unless they're secretly building something behind the scenes, I don't think it's going to happen. But you look at this, for instance, they had a chance of losing a charter, and this could also lead to them losing a charter as well, but they had a chance to lose a charter even this year. We talked about this on the channel last year during August when Denny Hamill had not signed his contract extension. There was a lot of talk to 2311 Racing. They were going to go to Ford, and they were going to be a Ford organization to buy a charter from SHR. Because right now, what is required with the deal that Ford has at SHR is they are required to have four chartered organizations and teams. And if they leave and go to Chevrolet, they could sell one of their charters off to another organization like a 2311 Racing who wants to expand to three full-time cars or a Trackhouse Racing who wants to eventually expand to a four-car full operation as well and keep Daniel Suarez and SVG and Zane Smith there as well. But you think about SHR, they've lost opportunities also on great drivers. They lost opportunities on Kyle Larson and Kyle Busch and Zane Smith and even someone like maybe about that. I don't know where they could have gotten. They've lost opportunities on really great talents and really great drivers to get behind the wheel because Ford said no on those guys, especially during the Kyle Busch sweepstakes. And I think if SHR wants to be competitive once again, they need to leave Ford. I don't think that they're going to be a Tier 1 team if they stay with Ford. So I think they are going to be leaving Ford at the end of this year. If you want my early prediction where I think they're going to go, I think they're going to go to Chevrolet more than likely. It just makes a lot of sense. They've been with Chevrolet in the past, and they were competitive with Chevrolet. I think a dark horse is Toyota and maybe even Honda, but I think more than likely they're going to switch over to Chevrolet in the 2024 five season. We'll see what happens, and we'll see if SHR does, in fact, leave and go over to Toyota or whatever manufacturer they go to. But it sounds like right now they're going to be leaving Ford at the end of this season. So, that is good for today's NASCAR news and motorsports news video. I want to thank you guys for watching. Please subscribe to the channel, turn notifications on, so if I win a video, that will go live on my channel. Follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and support on Patreon as well. Let's go to below that and comment your thoughts below on today's video. What manufacturer do you think SHR is going to in 25? Let me your thoughts in the comments below. And do you think Honda is actually going to join NASCAR? Let me your thoughts in the comments below. Later today on the channel, we have the NASCAR Xfinity Series race picks for Phoenix. Tomorrow on the channel, I have the NASCAR Cup Series race picks for Phoenix. And I'm also going to have the paint scheme video dropping as well. Then Friday, we're going to have a NASCAR news video on the channel. If any major news breaks throughout the week, we'll cover it right here. So anyways, like I said, I want to thank you guys for watching today's episode, and I'll see you guys next time for more great, awesome NASCAR content and other motorsports content on the channel like this. Take care, everybody.